Thank you for choosing to watch our video. Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon for notifications of new content. Leave us a comment and watch the other videos that we're happy to provide for you. And now, on to the sermon. In the last part of the book of Acts, Paul is going to Jerusalem. And he's going to Jerusalem because he's been raising a contribution. A contribution that he's been working on for a long, long time. Interestingly, Larry, both passages that Larry read, I'm going to bring up in the lesson. But he read about 2 Corinthians, from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. That's part of the writing that Paul did talking about this contribution that's coming. So we get to Acts chapter 21, he's brought the contribution to the elders at Jerusalem. While he was there, the elders at Jerusalem advised Paul there were four men who were taking a vow, and this vow was done under the law of Moses. The elders there suggested that Paul pay their, their expenses for You had to offer sacrifices and things like that, so it could be an expensive proposition. So they suggested, Paul, you need to pay the expenses for these, for these four men and go through the vow with them, which he did. But they came up with this charge that Paul had brought a Gentile into the temple, Trophimus, an Ephesian. And because of this, it made this enormous uproar. And our, the reason I bring this up is because after this uproar, basically the whole rest of the book of Acts is Paul giving a defense for what had essentially not been done, a, a false charge. But he has to give. So once you get to Acts chapter 21 or so, the rest of the book are five defenses that Paul has to give. Some in Jerusalem, but the majority of them, Felix, Festus, and Agrippa, are in Caesarea. Then he gets sent to Rome. That's Acts 27 and 28. They have the shipwreck. He gets to Rome. He stays in the city for now for two years under house arrest. He's released. He writes... He writes First and Second Timothy, and then uh, probably is, is put to death. But he makes these five separate defenses. The last one, which is the one that we're going to talk about, is the lengthiest one. It's the most comprehensive one. When you look in Acts chapter 26, it kind of follows exactly what he wants Agrippa to know. He talks about the fact, I mean, he readily discusses the fact that he was a faithful Jew, he was a faithful Pharisee, he admits that he persecutes the followers of Jesus Christ, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, he believed him, he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, that's what verse 19 says, he decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. He was a witness and a minister, those are the words that, that Luke chose, a witness and a minister of the grace of God. And he makes this appeal. And as he makes this appeal, famously, what we're going to talk about in Acts 26, 26 through 28, is that Agrippa was almost persuaded. So in the lesson this morning, we're going to talk about some things that were almost proven. Now, almost is in quotation marks. That's how I'm going to treat it. It was proven. It was proven. And what's so important are the four things this morning that were indeed proven. I use the word almost because it almost convinced Agrippa to become a Christian. So what were those four things? Well, those four things, kind of like as I would mentioned before, as we start the, the year, these four things are things that, that we hold deeply, that we believe deeply in, and that we exhort people all of the time to follow and do and believe and hold fast to. So let's kind of take a look into this account and see what are the four things that were indeed proven but almost as far as Agrippa's case is concerned. So, Acts chapter 26, let's begin in verse 26. The first one is that God's works are evident. So, here's what Paul said. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention. King Agrippa's attention. 
since this thing was not done in a corner. So all of this conversion account that he had gone through, and I told you we'd seen exactly what he went through in Acts chapter 26. As he gets down to the end, if you kind of just glance up the, the chapter just a little bit, Felix charges him that essentially he had been driven mad by much learning. But he says, I know that you know these things. I know that you have observed them. Paul actually made the point that Agrippa was essentially an expert in, in all things Jewish. So when you think about what Agrippa actually saw, he saw everything that God intended for all of mankind to see. Because the gospel is not just a story. It's not just an account. It's a very carefully assembled history, a very carefully assembled exhortation, very carefully assembled commands that have been fleshed out, that have been investigated, that have been inspired by God and then presented for mankind. So don't think that because the New Testament is an assemblage of 27 books that these were just random things that were put together. Not at all. These were things that God intended and a message that God absolutely intended. Now I said about Larry's one verse that he mentioned, which was 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now go to Acts chapter 2 and look in Acts chapter 2, what we read just a little bit prior to around the table. Acts chapter 2, prior to us partaking of the Lord's Supper. But look how specifically this was mentioned. So here are words. Verse 22, men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, and this was what was important. It was attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through Him in your midst as you yourselves also know. All of the people there on Pentecost knew that this had taken place. Somewhere around 30 years later is where we are in Acts chapter 26. And Paul is making the same point to Agrippa. Agrippa, you know that this has happened. I know that you know this has happened. They weren't done in secret. They weren't done in a corner. In fact, when you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, it's going to sound a lot like what Luke just wrote in the book of Acts. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and let's read verse 12. Paul writes, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you. By who? By him. He's writing about himself. Were accomplished among you with all perseverance. And look at this. In signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So just what Jesus came to do with the signs and the wonders and the miracles, Paul came to do, he calls it something different, signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. But the fact was, there was evidence. We're going to show you the power of the gospel. And then when it was written, that same meticulousness, that same desire, that same ability to prove what was done, is all wrapped up into these 27 books that we call the New Testament. Just as an example, let's look in Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, we're going to read Luke's... This is often called Luke's prologue to the Gospel, but I want you to note this. Luke chapter 1, and let's begin in verse 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word delivered them to us. It's essentially the same word that Paul declared he was, a, a minister and a witness. So now here's Luke saying, we were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word. It seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Again, inspired by God, thought out, researched, detailed, taken from eyewitnesses, and put together. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first four verses talk about the establishment of Paul preaching the gospel to them. But then, to kind of back up those claims when you start in verse 5 through verse 8, 
It's all of the resurrection appearances. We didn't read verse 24 of Acts chapter 2. Larry did. But it talks about Christ, about Christ being risen up from the grave. And that forms the proof of what God had for mankind. Proof that hundreds of people witnessed and saw. You add to that. I can make one more point. You add to that. All of the fact that Jesus is teaching. How many times in the Gospels does it mention that Jesus is preaching before the multitudes? How many times just in the Gospel of John you've got Jesus crying out among the multitudes. Sometimes in Jerusalem. Sometimes in other places. Galilee or Judea. But Jesus is crying out. It's not like all of the information was stuck over in a corner to never be revealed. It was out in the open for people to listen to, evaluate, investigate. Do I want to put, do I want to stake my life? Do I want to change my life? Do I want to practice what I profess based on what I'm seeing and on what I'm hearing? Guys, that's the way God always intended it to be. In fact, I think I can go further and, and make the point in the grandest physical way possible. God never did anything that was going to be secret from mankind. Now this has got all kinds of references in it, but they all essentially say the same thing. God created the world. This is why I talked about it being on the largest physical scale that I could think of. God created the world and in the creation of the world. All of these things are manifest. Since we're in Acts, let's just go to these two references that I have here. Acts chapter 14. Let's look in Acts chapter 14 and verse 17. But as you'll note on the screen in front of you, there are places in the Old Testament and there's places in the New Testament. But Acts chapter 14 verse 17. Nevertheless, He did not leave Himself without a witness. This is God. And that He did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. Filling our hearts with food and gladness. The, the blessings that we have, we receive from God on a physical scale. And then just jump down to chapter 17. Move ahead to chapter 17. Let's look in verse 24. Chapter 17, verse 24. To people who had no knowledge of God, Paul said to the Athenians, God who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is worshipped with man, men's hands, as though we needed anything. Since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. And He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all of the face of the earth as had, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him though He is not far from each one of us. Grope for Him and find Him. And God made it possible so that someone isn't going to have to work very hard to find Him. That's what the heavens and the earth do. They declare the handiwork of God. So the first thing that was facetiously almost proven is just simply the fact that God's works are evident. They are manifest. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 26. Back to, back to Acts chapter 26, because we're going to make a point. And this point, I don't think generally is made very often, but it is very, very important. So Acts chapter 26, and we're going to look in verse 27. King Agrippa, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And then he says, I know that you do. How many times? Have people thought when it comes to studying the Old Testament that the Old Testament is kind of like wasted time? I mean, we, we know we can, we can run through the passages. I, I can just appeal to them very quickly. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 talk about how the Old Commandment, the Old Testament, the Old Commandments have been nailed to the cross. They've been, they've been removed. We could go to Hebrews chapter 9. And you've got verses 14 and 15. And those talk about how Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant, a better covenant, a covenant that was established with better promises, with His eternal redemption. And because of that, it 
removed the Old Testament. So, I mean, that's, it's clearly established. But that kind of begs the question. Is there any value in the Old Testament? And I want to show you that there is. In fact, there's a lot of value in the Old Testament. Because first of all, it just answers life's most fundamental questions. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Where did I come from? Where did the earth come from? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why am I here? Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verses 13 and 14. We're here to fear God and keep His commandments because that's going to be the whole duty of man. There's going to come a time when everyone's going to stand before God in judgment because of what they've done and answer for what they've done. Well, where do I first learn that? Back in the Old Testament. Secondly, it reveals our relationship with God. It reveals the fact, Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, we're made in the image of God. It reveals in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that God breathed within mankind the breath of life. It begins to refer to all of mankind as God's children. It was a special relationship. God loved us because God created us. And that's a very, very easy relationship to understand and grab hold of. A lot of us in this audience have children, and we understand the connection to loving your children. Whether they're, whether they're good or bad, whether it's difficult or whether it's not so difficult, we understand the fact of loving children. So this is the same idea of understanding our relationship with God. But we also, the Old Testament also explains to us that that relationship is based on holiness. And so when people do something that's against the holiness of God, Isaiah 59 says that it caused a separation between man and God. Ephesians chapter 2, to supplement, I'm using the New Testament passage, but Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 tells us that we're dead in our sins. Ephesians 2 verse 12 tells us that we're without hope and without God in the world. But where do I first learn that? I first learned that in the Old Testament. So it tells me where I, my, my most basic questions, why am I here, where am I going, what am I doing? It explains my relationship with God. Third, it talks about the nature and the attributes of God. The nature and the attributes of God, I thought about putting up its own little kind of separate idea here, a separate screen here, it probably should have, but I learned that God is omniscient. He knows everything. I learned that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. I learned that He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. I learned that He's eternal. I learned that He's holy. I learned that He's just. I learned that He is love. All of that. Yes, all of that I learned from the New Testament. But I learned that from the Old Testament. The Old Testament has amazing evidential material in it. It has amazing evidential value in it. Because, and it's been... I mean, it, it, the case has been made, and I firmly believe it, that's why I've repeated it, that maybe the number one way to, to actually prove that there is a God and that God can control history, that God is powerful enough to, to save us from our sins, is found in the fact of fulfilled prophecy. Now, that can't be the only thing that we hang everything about Scripture on, but it is unbelievably useful to, to benefiting our belief in Scripture. Prophecy has three things. First of all, prophecy in the Old Testament was very specific. Very specific. It wasn't vague. It wasn't vague. Secondly, prophecy was timed so that there was no other possible explanation. So there's lots of people, in fact, tabloids would have done this either this week or last week. They'll have their experts, their psychics, and they will predict, and those psychics will evaluate the world around them, and they'll make predictions. I can stand here and make a prediction to you right now. 
The war in Ukraine, it's probably going to go on the whole of 2024. There we go. I'm a prophet. They take what's going on in the world and they make a guess. And obviously, it's, it's usually a pretty good guess because they can just kind of... You know, Jesus said, you can look, you can tell the weather. We've all got the ability to guess. And sometimes we've got a pretty good ability to get. I mean, we're pretty good at it. Brethren, biblical prophecy was different. It was different. And because it was so different, it becomes absolutely, unbelievably valuable to us. And then lastly, I just want to say that it was, it was fulfilled. I mean, it wasn't just... Something that was a little bit fulfilled. It wasn't just something that was sort of good. It was fulfilled in specifics. And let me just give you some examples of this. Jim's going through, he went through last year with the men, the last two years with the men, the book of Daniel. Old Testament has 39 books. I'm going to pick one of them, Daniel. He's going through Daniel now with the with the ladies. We'll meet in a couple of weeks and he'll keep going through the book of Daniel. Just one book. Just one book. Twelve chapters. Twelve chapters. Not a big book. Not a big book. One chapter. First of all, Daniel's got unbelievable problems. Think about the image. You know, we learned about the image from Daniel in Daniel chapter 2. Probably a lot of us as kids in, in whatever different religious group, maybe even in this own congregation. We learned about Daniel chapter 2 in that image, and, and we can kind of picture that image. Do you realize what Daniel was doing? Daniel was prophesying about five or six hundred years of world history, and it all came true. It all came true. So one chapter, which was at Daniel chapter 2, I was just talking about Daniel. We could just have a whole little dissertation about Daniel, but we won't do that. Let me pick one chapter. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. If you go to read Daniel chapter 11, it's going to feel kind of far out. Because the historical background of Daniel chapter 11 Okay, so and I've and I've actually set to counting this just to make sure that I'm not just spouting off a number that I took from someone else. Daniel chapter eleven. If you'll look at those forty something verses in Daniel chapter eleven, are about a hundred and thirty specific prophecies of what would take place in a relatively narrow point in time where Daniel was speaking about two or three hundred years in the future. So Daniel, from his vantage point in time, giving about 130 prophecies in one chapter that would be fulfilled in about two or three hundred years' time. And they're all accurate. We know they're all accurate. We know when Daniel was written, it's not like Daniel could just kind of like post day to check. <laughs> Grayson and I were talking about that. It's not like Daniel could just put, it's not like Daniel could write it in the third century AD and pretend that he lived a thousand years prior and then just make it like he was this amazing prophet. Honestly, I'll tell you what, biblical scholarship is just too good for that. It's just too good for that now. When we hold to the fact that Daniel chapter 11 prophesied stuff hundreds of years in the future, it's because we have actual pieces of Daniel. And we can date those actual pieces of Daniel that existed before those prophecies were ever fulfilled. And that proves that Daniel had the capability to predict the future in specific detail. Hundreds of years before it took place. Where is the only way? What is the only explanation for that? It was the power of God. Because God was the one who could tell the future. In fact, I did want to show you this quote because I love this quote. This quote by Dr. Oswald T. Alice said, Is it any wonder 
that massive volumes have to be written in oceans of ink spilled in the attempt to make the Bible say exactly the opposite of what it does say? Daniel in exile, 600 years before Jesus, prophesying about stuff that's going to happen in the intertestamental period of time that is around 300 years in the future. That's the point of it. His point is we've got oceans of ink, reams of paper, to try to explain that's not the case. He goes on and says, Is it any wonder that the critics find it difficult to find a satisfactory and edifying explanation for what they believe to have been a deliberate falsification of history, a pious fraud? Now this man wrote these words, I'm not kidding, 50 years ago. 50 years ago. And 50 years of trying has still not defeated the fact that Daniel stands true. He was writing about the book of Daniel. And in 50 years, it's not been shown or proven that Daniel was actually false or unreliable or in any way pretending to be something that he was. It's, just, it's absolutely amazing. This is why we need the Old Testament. But I've got a couple more for you. It magnified sin. Let's look in Romans 7 verse 13. Romans chapter 7, verse 13. And we just look at these because these become more and more important for us. Romans chapter 7, verse 13. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. That he's talking about the law, the old law, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, has come, it's been given, it's declared righteousness, it's declared unrighteousness, and it's become death to him because now he has this explanation that what he does and that what he feels and that what he says is actually in violation of the law of God. So he keeps on going so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So it showed that Sin was defined, it was described, it was denounced, it became exceedingly sinful. It doesn't mean that it became any worse in the sight of God. It just means that what people were perhaps thinking in their minds, this inkling they thought, well, is, it, is it right to steal from someone? Is it, is it right to hurt someone? Is it, is, it, is it right to commit murder? Well, here comes the law. And the law said explicitly, it declared the righteousness of God explicitly. And so it magnifies sin. It kind of gives it in, in every way possible an explanation for us to study it, to understand it, and to know what sin is. And then of course, who could neglect that along with the magnification of sin, there was also the explanation of God's grace who would come through Jesus Christ to provide a way of salvation. And that's part of the, the prophetic nature of the Old Testament. Let me just give you one more. It also, it also gives the background for a lot of the New Testament. New Testament words like called, offering, promise, seed, grace, Birthright, circumcision, redeem, tabernacle, priest, sanctify. You just go on and on. All of those words that the New Testament have, have, their, have their foundation in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament explains what all of those words mean. We go through Matthew, Acts, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews, James, Revelation. They are saturated with the Old Testament. And not only are they saturated with the Old Testament, but here's the really neat part. All of those books and, and more, but those are the prominent ones. All of those New Testament books take parts of the Old Testament and the neat part is they like integrate it into their writings and they explain what the Old Testament was talking about. So I don't have to take this mysterious 39 book volume and try to sort it all out. It's because the Old Testament is taking into the New Testament and then the New Testament, by and large, 
does a fantastic job of explaining it. One of those books that I mentioned is the last one in the New Testament, which is the book of Revelation. Lots of people just think the book of Revelation is absolutely mysterious. But it's full of Old Testament language. So if you understand the Old Testament and you bring it into the book of Revelation, you go a long, long way in understanding its message. So I, th I think it's really neat that when he asked in verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. He knew he could establish the fact that King Agrippa, knowing those prophets, making the hard and true case, here's why you need to believe in Jesus Christ. And I think kind of following along with that, we continue to preach Jesus Christ not only as the, as the God of the Old Testament, and I mean integrated into the Godhead, but also as the God of the New Testament, which the Gospel of John does a great job of, John chapter 8, verse 58, before Abraham was, I am, and that I am was a designation of eternalness. Of eternalness. He was making this incredible case to Agrippa that he just couldn't walk away from. Unfortunately, he did. Third though, let's notice very quickly. Faith alone couldn't save. Again, back to verse 27, Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. I, I can't imagine, I, I don't have any proof of this, so I won't stand real firm and hard on it, but it seems unreasonable that Paul would have asked a question like that, that he didn't know the answer to. So, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe them. So Paul, either by hearing it or by speaking to Agrippa prior to what maybe Luke records, he knew that. He knew that. He had that knowledge. But in verse 28, in verse 28, almost you persuade me to three words, become a Christian. We use the phrase all of the time to become a Christian. Here's your biblical evidence for becoming a Christian. So, the point is, Agrippa did believe, but he wasn't ready to become a Christian. Let's look in James chapter 2. Let's look in James chapter 2, because James chapter 2, we're going to look in verse 19. James chapter 2, we're going to look in verse 19, and there it reads, You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Do you believe the prophets? I know you do. The demons believe. They tremble. But look at verse 20. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Almost you persuade me to become a Christian. So what we have essentially is the fact that faith alone doesn't save us. There's got to be more to it. In fact, while you're in James chapter 2, just take up and keep reading in verse 21. Keep reading in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by his works and not by faith only. Now that was a long explanation, but this one's a shorter one. A shorter example, look in verse 25. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Agrippa couldn't make up in faith. He couldn't make up in faith what he lacked in commitment. Or what he lacked in obedience. You've got to have both of them. You've got to have faith. You've got to have obedience. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. There's two parts to that. There's what I believe, what's in my heart, and then there's what I do. I seek out someone to immerse me in water to wash away my sins. 
There's two parts to that. He learned that faith alone couldn't save him. Without works, it was useless. So, finally, our last point. Let's turn now. Salvation to being man's choice. Verse 28. Verse 28. Acts chapter 26. Here it is. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. There is a prominent doctrine. And there are now a lot of people who believe in Calvinism or it's now referred to as Reformed Theology. So I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush here. But there's lots of people who believe in Reformed Theology. So the, the old traditional view of Reformed Theology includes a concept of unconditional election. Meaning that God had elected mankind. He had elected various people to be saved and various people to be lost. Now again... Lots of people today don't believe that. But back when it was first conceived, back by John Calvin, that's what he taught, unconditional election. So think about this. Think about this. Let's assume that Agrippa was one of the elect to be lost. Let's say that God, in before time began, elected Agrippa to be lost. If that were the case, then why would there be any need to persuade him? But then on the other hand, let's say that Agrippa was elected to be saved. Then why would you have to persuade him? Honestly, I think this is why a lot of people have kind of moved away from this thinking in in Reformed theology. is because it's just, there's such a disconnect with that particular doctrine with what you see in the New Testament. The the fact of the matter was, Agrippa, like every other soul who's lived long enough to become accountable, he had a choice. He had a choice. And he made his choice. It was a sad choice and it was an unfortunate choice because you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. All of that was there. All of the proof was there. You almost did it. I think about Ezekiel chapter 18. Look in verse 21. Ezekiel chapter 18. And look in verse 21. Ezekiel chapter 18 is a a fantastic chapter that talks about the the consequences of people's actions. It's a really, really good chapter about this. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 21 says, But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he's committed, he keeps all of my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he will surely live, he shall not die. So what what does that include? Well, it includes all of the decision making. All of the decision making. And that's the point. You know, salvation is going to be our choice to accept it and abide by it and live by it. Or to be like Agrippa and just say that we're almost lost. That's what it means to accept the grace of God. I mean, we stand in the grace of God. We preach the grace of God. We want everyone to accept the grace of God. But there's a very important word that I use. Accept. You've got to believe it. You've got to follow it. And this is why we do what we do. This is why we, we say what we say. I told you that we would end with something, and I want to show you a quote by David Wales. David Wales is not a fan of what has essentially been a decades-long marketing experience by churches to try to get people to come by all of these different kinds of means. I'll let you see in the quote. He's not a fan of that. And here's what he says. Much of it is replete with tricks, gadgets, gimmicks, and marketing ploys as it shamelessly adapts itself to our emptied out, blinded, postmodern world. There is too little about it that bespeaks the holiness of God. And without the vision for any reality of this holiness, the gospel becomes trivialized, life loses its depth, God becomes transformed into a product to be sold, faith into a recreational activity to be done, and the church into a club for the like-minded. 
So the whole reason that we've studied three verses that come at the end of Paul's fifth defense is because those three verses argue exactly against what Mr. Wells, I think very appropriately, has pointed out. It is really easy for people to trivialize the gospel. And let me tell you, people have done it by the millions just in this country. We don't want to trivialize the gospel. Last week we talked about looking at life with purpose and applying that purpose to this new year and and looking forward to building our lives around purpose. And that was, I hope, was a good message. But now we talk about the real meat of the issue. Looking into these texts and seeing in these texts the evidence of a life-transforming gospel. The gospel that God always intended to be delivered, to be studied, to be held in high regard among all. When you take that away, you miss what God was always wanting to do. And I think of the fact how sad it was that he was almost persuaded. With all of this laid out in front, he almost did it. We're going to sing, almost persuaded. We're going to come to the conclusion as we sing it, almost but lost. We're not the judge of Agrippa. We don't know if Agrippa maybe in later years made a different decision. Boy, we sure hope he did. In that moment in time, we know what it takes to be saved. Paul knew what it took to be saved. And Paul rebutted, we didn't even talk about Paul's rebuttal after that, but he wanted that, that all people were like, Paul, like him, that, that he had the capability to, to stand in the gospel, to hold fast to the gospel, to preach the gospel. Except the chains that he was in, but he could not convince Agrippa to come along with him. This morning, maybe we can convince you to come along with us in a journey, a journey of faithfulness. It's not going to be an easy one, because that's just not the nature of it. But it is going to be something that's eternally rewarding. And that's the point that Paul had made to Agrippa. Those prophets that talked about Jesus coming also talked about an eternal reward that's going to be in heaven for people who follow it. It it is there in the Old Testament. We want you to be a part of that. We want you to respond to it. We've talked a long time this morning. We hope and pray that you'll respond to it. Please come up here while we stand and we sing.